I want to pray for us before we get started because I just, I feel like that, uh, you know, when we started that song, God makes a way where there's no way. I feel like sometimes in our life we get to that place where we're like, God, I just don't see how this is going to work. And I just think there are people online watching and people in this room where you're at that place where you're like, God, I just don't see how this is going to work. And I want you to know that God can make a way even when you don't see it. So let me just pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, God. Lord, I know there's somebody sitting in this room that's looking online as well. God, that their circumstances in their life seem like a roadblock that's insurmountable. They feel overwhelmed. They feel trapped. And God, right now, I pray by faith that they would see that you can make a way. God, that they wouldn't quit, they wouldn't pull back, they wouldn't cower away, God, that they would stand firm in their faith, Lord, and trust you in the midst of this difficult situation, God, that you'll make a way. God, may that resonate with them right now. And Lord, may they cling to you and say, God, I trust that you will make a way. Even though I can't see it, God, I trust that you'll make a way. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And hopefully this morning will help you understand that a little bit better because what I understand is in my Christian life that there is the power of just doing one thing. And you probably see that in your own life, right? I remember when uh, I started my doctoral program and when I was in the first, we went to seminars. You didn't have to go attend class all day. You went for one week solid and it was just nothing but uh, eight or nine hours of class. And then sometimes there'd be two weeks back to back. But when we started, they showed us these books and they're about, uh, you know, 200 pages. And they said, before you get done, you will write one of these. I'm like, I've never written a book in my life, you know. Uh, I'm thinking a five-page paper was a struggle, and then ten pages is like a miracle. And now they're thinking, I'm going to write a 200-page book. And, and so uh, I, was, I was sort of a little overwhelmed, thinking, I'm not going to get through this. So we started, and they began to have us working on this project amidst all the other work, uh, the class work. This is sort of a side thing to it. And I got to... Uh, I think about 45 pages, uh, between 45 and 60 pages. I can't remember uh, specifically. It probably was more like 60. And I'm thinking, man, I am like a third of the way done with this thing. I'm getting excited. I see light at the end of the tunnel. And then I go back for the next seminar, and I sit down with my advisor, and he tells me, all right, now that you've got all this done, we can start your project. I'm thinking... <laughs> All of this, what was this for? They said, well, that's just the outline. I could write an outline on a napkin, right? I don't need 60 pages of outline. And so basically that 60 pages consolidated to about 20 pages, and it felt like I was starting all over again. Now, I don't know if you've been in one of those situations in life where you feel like you're making progress, and all of a sudden you get that gut punch, right? You're like, back and back up. You know, marriage can seem that way. Raising kids can seem that way. Having a job, doing a new project can seem that way. And so when you get to that place, what do you do? Well, I can say that I actually finished because they said no book, no diploma. So I had some motivation there. It's hard to pay all that money and not get a diploma, right? I mean, how do you justify that? But there's something that makes us push through sometimes. There's something that makes us understand that there really is power in just doing a little bit. And the way that I got finished is every time we'd go back, we'd have a little bit more we had to have done. And so it became bite-sized pieces. What if you and I learned the power of that? I promise you it change your life. Just one little thing. Change a habit today, change my life tomorrow, the next day, the next day. And that's really what we've been talking about. And so in week one, we, we, were, we were diving in and talking about our choices and other things over the last few weeks. And we, we talked about this, this power of God first. And I gave you a challenge for one week, 30 minutes. And y'all were sitting in here, so you know what the challenge was. And so I'm a firm believer in accountability, all right? Some of you didn't need the challenge, some of you did. But if you took the challenge and you kept it, just raise your hand. All right, 
So what was the challenge? For those of you who didn't raise your hand because you weren't here last week, I'm sure of that, okay? Uh, 30 minutes in God's Word, right? So I'm reading God's Word for 15, and then I am listening for 10, and then I'm talking to God. I'm not asking for anything, praying for other people and other things besides myself. Now listen, you're going to understand how important that is after this message today. But this is what I know. If you did that challenge, then guess what? You can do it again. And guess what? If you didn't do it, don't count yourself as a failure. Just realize that you're starting today. It's never too late to start, right? And so this morning, though, we're talking about the power of one habit. Now, before I get into habit, let's sort of define something for yourself. I want you to think for a minute for yourself. What is one habit? Don't blurt it out, please. What is one habit that you wish you could stop? Just think about it. I know everybody has one because you're working on it right now. Or it's working on you. It can be a lot of different things. But it's your habit. Second question is, is what is one habit that you think if you started today, it would significantly change your life? What is that one habit to start? Now listen, there's some things that I, like I can't start the habit of growing hair. That's just not going to work for me, okay? But what is a habit that you could start that would change you? I want to talk to you this morning about one of those habits that I think would revolutionize your life and the lives of people around you that would change you so significantly that it would free you from some things that you want to be free from. And it has so much power and potential that if we just grabbed a hold of it, you would look back and say, that was the day, that was the habit that transformed my life. What is that habit? Well, I don't want to give it to you until I read this verse. Luke 9, 23, Jesus says this, speaking to the crowd. If anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. So Jesus asked the question, does anyone want to be my follower? If you do, there's some stipulations, but I just want to start with the question for those that are in the room, if you're online, if you want to be a follower of Christ, and you sincerely want to be, and you claim to be a Christian, he's saying, if you want to be my follower, if that's just you and it defines you, would you just raise your hand and say amen? Amen. 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 All right, so now that we got that out of the way, we know who we're talking to, right? So he says, if you want to be my followers, you got to give up your own ways. Now, what are my own ways that I have to give up? Because, you know, apparently that's one thing that's holding me back. So think about what your own ways are. Because he's saying, listen, in order to follow me, you got to let go of them. And so the habit that I want to talk about is the habit of letting go, right? It's a habit that is so often overlooked, but it's a habit that is so empowering. Because Jesus, Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, which you already said you want to, then there's some things you got to let go of. Now, he says let go of. So what are some of those things? Well, maybe it's, uh, it's my idea of what pleasure is. Maybe it's my idea of what success is. My idea of what marriage is. My idea of what family is. My idea of what, and you fill in the blank. You see, when my idea contradicts Jesus' idea, then it's my way, Right? And so what we want to do is say, all right, what is that difference there? What is God trying to show me? Because God, listen, God wants me to look at my life and say, is there anything that's leading you away from me? If it is, then that is what is defined as your way. 
your way is not necessarily his way. But what God wants to do is he wants to bring us together with him so that it's our way following his way. And our way actually becomes a byproduct of the life that he wants us to live. So it transforms us and changes us. And, and here's why it's important. Whether you realize it or not, the bondage that most of us are in is because we follow our way. The shackles that hold on to us are because we follow our way. Now, sometimes we think that our way is the best way. But in this case, I want you to understand that our way actually keeps us from God's way. It keeps us from going down his path. It keeps us distracted and actually ties us up. And so he says this, which is an indication of how we began to break free. He says, listen, you must give up your own way and take up your cross. Not his cross, your cross. And so what in the world does that mean, Jesus, that you want me to take up my cross? And so how does this work in life, right? I mean, how do you drive a car carrying your cross around, right? Uh, how do you sit at the dinner table? I mean, it's a little awkward carrying this thing around everywhere you go. What does it mean to take up my cross? Because it has everything to do with giving up my way. And if you don't understand what your cross is, then you don't understand how to bear it and carry it and the significance of it. So I want to understand what God is calling us to do because it's at the cross where freedom starts. You see, let me, let me explain this. When Jesus died on the cross... He took his cross. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he died on the cross not for his sins, but for the sins of other people, right? Not because he had done anything wrong. And so what happened is that when Jesus died on the cross, he bore the sins of all the world who would believe in him. You see, his sacrifice was sufficient for everyone. But it has not been appropriated by everyone, has it? Because if you haven't believed in Jesus, then you haven't experienced the power of what he did, the power of what he wanted to do. So I want you to understand that because if you don't understand that, you'll never understand what your cross is, all right? So you got to understand the significance of the cross of Jesus. And so basically the Bible says that he bore our sins. He who knew no sin took on the sins of everybody else. And so you and I are the benefactors of his cross because we're sinners. He's like, well, Greg, I'm not really sure if I'm a sinner. Well, let me help you with that understanding just for a minute, okay? Now, the reason you sin is because of who you are inside. So have you ever, please do not answer the question, it is rhetorical. Have you ever lied? Have you ever cheated? Have you ever lusted? Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever gossiped? That one got everybody. Okay, I realize. We'll move on now, right? <laughs> Even if you called it a prayer request in gossip, do you still gossiped, okay? So now that we're understanding it, Everybody in the whole world has the same need. We all need somebody to die for our sins or we have to pay for our own. And so Jesus bore the sins of the world. Everybody that would believe in him is a benefactor of what he did on the cross. And God wants us to grasp that because he's telling us, listen, you've got to take up your cross and you've got to do something that's going to be transforming to you because you understand that. And so what God wants us to understand here in this process is, is that what Jesus went through, I have to be a recipient of that. And so let me explain how that works. 
When you come to the cross where Jesus died, and when I say come to the cross, you're coming to Jesus, and he died on the cross, then I bring my life, and what has to happen in my life is that I actually experience the same thing that Jesus did because the cross is a symbol of death. And so when Jesus died on the cross, I come to the cross. And when I come to the cross, I don't go around the cross. I go through the cross. And when I go through the cross, I experience the very thing that Jesus did. My old life dies and I take on new life. And in that new life, I carry the very righteousness of God that I could never create myself. Because I bear Jesus' righteousness. But here's what happened. Before I crossed through, I had to experience death. Death to what? My past. My past died at the cross. He said, well, why do I keep thinking about it? I'm asking the same question. Because there's something going on here. Listen, the devil is wearing us out with this. We don't fully understand what happened at the cross because we keep carrying the baggage of the past into the present and we keep living under this yoke of bondage when God says, listen, at the cross, I died. And when you came to the cross, you died. So what changes? What happens? How does it transform me? In Philippians 3, 7 through 8, Paul sort of... Well, let me back back up. When we get to the cross, we've got to understand what God wants to do in us. You see, sometimes we think God just wants to forgive us of sin. But forgiveness of sin is so that I will be released from my past. You see, I need forgiveness so I can be released from it. And so at the cross, we receive forgiveness, but so many of us never fully appropriate the release part. You see, you can be released from something and still be chained to something. You can be released from it in practicality, but in practice, you're still chained to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can already be released from it, and here's what I'm telling you is what God wants us to understand. You have been released from your past, but in practicality, some of you are still chained to your past, and God is saying, that is not what I rescued you from. You need to be released from your past and practice who you are. Why? Because that's where the victory is. You see, in Luke 9, 24 and 25, it says, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. Let me stop there just for a second. If I hang on to my ways, I lose my way. You see, oftentimes in life, we think that uh, you got to live your own life. You got to be your own person. You got to do your own thing. But what your own thing is, is your way. And your way has got you to where you are, right? Your way is what the thing that messes your life up. And if you don't realize it yet, I promise you one day you will. You may be living in the heyday of your life thing. I'm young, I'm joined, I got everything I want. I promise you, your way is the wrong way. Whether you realize it or not. So, he says, if You want to hang on to your life, you have to lose it. you got to give up your way. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? And so what good is it if I gain all of my way and then I get to the end and realize that my way was the wrong way? I mean, what good is that, right? Hey, man, I got there. Where's there? Wrong place. Man, it was a great trip. I got in the wrong place, though. Man, I enjoyed my, I'm still at the wrong place. It doesn't matter if you enjoyed it. It doesn't matter if it was great, which it won't be, I promise you. So what good is it if you get to the wrong place? Man, we got a reservation at the hotel, and we're in the wrong state. 
you're like the dumbest person in the world at that time, right? I mean, your whole family's looking at you and saying, you, you're Uber. <laughs> and so he's saying, listen, you've got to give it up. How do you give it up? When you come to the cross, you give it up. It's all gone. God, listen, you don't get saved if, you, if there's not something that you want to be saved from, right? I mean, just think about it. Why would I want to get saved if there's nothing to be saved from? If I am in my friend's backyard and his dog gets out and it starts running across the yard at me, I am yelling. Why? Not because I'm happy, but because I need to be saved. When you come to Jesus, the only reason you would even possibly come is that you know that you need to be saved from something and that something would be the sin that keeps trapping you, controlling you, and robbing you of life. You know that there's something missing. And God says, give it up. So listen, it's easy to want to give that up, right? It's easy to want to be rescued from something like that. That's what God wants us to grasp. Don't think it's glamorous when it's not. We've got to have this idea that in order to be rescued and have the full benefit of our salvation, we've got to practice the habit of letting go of what God has already let go of us from, already released us from, already relinquished from us. And so here's the thing is, if I don't let go, I don't experience the life that God wants me to have. And so at the cross, I let go. Now here, I let go because I have been let go. I am able to let go of it because it has let go of me because Jesus said at the cross, that's it. It is finished. There's no longer any work to do. You don't have to come back and pay for this again. You don't have to bring it back up again. You don't have to confess it again. You don't have to feel guilty again. You don't have to have it hung over your head again. Why? It's done. It's finished. That's what the cross does. So, the problem is, is that you and I so often we know let me move this to the side a little bit we know that we've been forgiven we know that we have salvation but so often we keep living our life hanging on to our past You keep walking in the guilt that you have imposed on yourself. Why do I say that? Because God has not imposed it. God has dealt with it. And so we're looking to our past and we're looking and saying, you know what? I, I'm, still, I'm still feeling the, the consequences and so because of the consequences, you maybe you got a divorce and you're still feeling the consequences. But God is saying, listen, I've freed you from that. I've freed you from the feeling of guilt. You still have to live out the consequences, but the consequences are not there to defeat you. The consequences are there so you learn from your past and you keep moving forward. You keep looking for it. So many of us, we're living with one foot behind the cross and one foot in front of the cross, and we're torn in two because we keep dragging our past along with us as if it's going to do something for us. Listen, church, let it go. Start the habit of letting go because God is not holding it over you. The enemy's holding it over you. Now, when, I, when we first started the church, there was a lot of people, I've told this before, that came from Villarica because they could not believe that Greg Toller was a pastor. Because I have a past. And it's not a good past. It's not one that, you know, if you put it on your resume and turn it in to apply for being a pastor, 
that you would get it to the top of the chart, top of the list. I mean, they were like, they're, they're not going to throw it in the trash can. They're looking for a shredder to shred it so they can burn it before they get rid of it. Because of my past. But this is what I know about me. There are a lot of things I can feel guilty of for my past. I mean, there are a lot of things. I can mention a lot of those things to you that are guilt-worthy. And people say, but don't you, don't you remember when? Listen, I remember all that, but I choose by faith that Jesus dealt with that, and I don't have to recount my past because Jesus has reset my past. You need to give that movie to God. You need to give that script to God that happened before the cross because it's no longer your script anymore. It can be your chains, but God broke those chains. And so you and I walk in a new reality. And the apostle tells us in Philippians 3, 7 through 8, he says, but one thing, excuse me, but what things were gained to me, I have counted loss for Christ. And so here's what he's saying is, is everything back there, everything before Jesus, it's all good. It's loss. Yes, indeed, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. So listen. My past... Paul says, I count as his loss. Now, I want you to understand something. If it's no good, and it has no more purpose anymore, and it's in your house, and you keep it, you're considered a hoarder, right? Everybody's like, you're going through inventory of everything you got in your house right now. I understand. I'll give you a minute. For all the hoarders in the room, right? If you don't need it anymore, and it's not useful, then get rid of it, right? You don't need your past anymore. You learn from it, but it's not useful in the sense of dictating to your life your direction. And so dismiss it, put it away, and don't let it control you. There's a shift that has to take place. And what that shift is, is a refocusing. He says, I counted it as all as, as rubbish because I compare it to the excellence of having a relationship with God. Because God in this relationship is so much better than my past so much better than what I give up it's so much so how do I know that well listen the excellence of the knowledge you see we got to have knowledge about Jesus so we'll know how much better he is okay if you just come to church on Sunday and you just hear me speak one message a week and then you go out and you're never in the word you're not building your knowledge of who Jesus is your knowledge of what he offers you and so our knowledge is power in our lives and so listen if you keep trying to tiptoe back to your past God's saying you don't really understand what you have in the present I was talking to somebody that a few weeks ago that struggles with drugs talking about you know how they enjoy it and everything I said you know what and I've done drugs in my lifetime I said you know what the best drug I have ever had is Jesus. There is no high like it in the world. And when you get in the presence of God, you don't want to leave. You don't want to come down from that high. It's like being in a worship service. You're like, whoo, Jesus, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, right? How does that happen? Because the more I know him, the more I want to be with him. The more I know him, the more I want to walk with him. The more I know him, the more I want what he has for me. And when he gives me a little taste of what he has for me, it's like going to Krispy Kreme with a hot light on, right? You just can't satisfy yourself. Woo! Because God always has a hot light on. Isn't that amazing? When you wake up in the morning, hot light's on. When you go to bed, hot light's on. Why? Because God is saying, I want to be insatiable in your life 
I want you to know me so much that you look at the past and Paul says, I just counted as rubbish, garbage, trash. You know that stuff you take out. Open the lid and all the flies are in there, right? Have you ever... Have you ever been to one of those restaurants, and you, this has happened to me multiple times, where they don't have enough parking in the front, and you have to park in the back? And typically, you have to walk by the dumpster. Has anybody had, have you ever had to walk by the dumpster where you parked at, and you're like, it's, it's one of those 100-degree summer days, and you're going out, and that stuff's been fermenting? Y'all tracking me? And I'm talking about it's, you get that first, and it sort of just sort of knocks you back, you know. You're like, "Woo, honey, do you wear perfume?" <laughs> no, nah, you know it's not your wife. Ain't nobody smell that bad, right? You're like, you're just trying to get by it as quick as you. You know, it's like it's like the wind's blowing your direction. It sort of follows you. He's like, "Which way do I go?" You know, you're trying to get in the restaurants. You don't like garbage. In the real world. So why do you keep bringing the garbage of your past with you? Matter of fact, listen. Next time the devil tells you how good your past was that you gave up. Because that's what he does. You see, he works on us. He starts reminding us, oh, you remember when you dated that person? Oh, they treated you right back then. They treated you like trash. You just don't remember. You remember when you used to go out and party with everybody? Oh, how fun that was. You remember when you could date all the girls? You never had a date. That was a problem, you know. He didn't tell you all those struggles, you know. You had like two dates the whole year. But he makes like think I had a date every week, right? He tried to make it all different, you know. He's, he's repainting the story. He's like, yeah, that, that was the good life. That was the good life. And you're sitting there and getting sucked into it. And what God is saying is, listen, that is garbage. And the next time he starts doing that to you, I want you just to do something. I want you to call that restaurant and ask him, hey, do you mind if I come and sit in your dumpster for a little while? <laughs> and while you're sitting there, just remember how much your past stinks, all right? And how, 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 how beautiful it was that God was able to deliver the garbage truck to your house and get rid of all your garbage so that you can be delivered from it, not so you can take it with you. Because I don't want the garbage, man. I, I, I don't even like rolling that can to the truck, to the, to the road, you know. You're like, you're like pulling it. It's like, whoo, man. The toller's got some bad trash. Now think about how weird that looks. Here you are as a believer. And God has taken the trash out. And you go back and you start picking up the trash that he's already taken out. Is that not the stupidest thing you have ever heard? So what do we do? Get rid of it. Get rid of what God has already gotten rid of. Get rid of your past that has already been dealt with. Refuse to let the enemy bring it up. How do I refuse? Jesus has to be more excellent than what that was. And I am here to tell you, Jesus is more excellent If you just pursue him. Because when we pursue him, he transforms our minds. He transforms all that stuff that we thought was good because we begin to know what really is good. We begin to know that God is good. And it changes us. You see, I didn't give you that 30-minute challenge because I thought you needed to do 30 minutes of something else. I gave you that 30-minute challenge last week because I know that 30 minutes in God's Word and 30 minutes with God will begin to give you a taste of His excellence, a taste of what real good is, a taste of what amazing is. You know, it's, 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 it's transforming to you and to me. And so the habit that I start is I start letting go. I start letting go of it. As a matter of fact, Paul says in that same ch chapter of Philippians, Brothers, I guess in sisters, I guess how you sisters, 
I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. Now, he's talking about this pursuit of Jesus, this understanding fully who he is and, and understanding fully who he is. And so I want you to understand something here. He hasn't taken hold of it because he hasn't arrived. And so I want you to grasp this as a believer. You are always striving to arrive, but you never arrive until Jesus comes and gets you. So let's just lay the playing field out here. There is nobody in this room that is perfect in every way, but when God looks at you, though, he sees you as being perfect in every way. Now, how is that possible? Because God looks at us through the lens of the cross. And so we're living our lives, and we're thinking, man, I messed up. Man, I still got stuff to deal with. And God is looking at us and saying, you know what? I know you're not perfect because my son is, though you are. And I am perfecting you, all right? So here's the thing. God frees us from our past. But unless I realize that I'm free from my past, oftentimes I start deflecting my past onto other people. And I start trying to make them feel guilty about their mistakes and guilty about their mess-ups, and guilty about their shortcomings. When God says, listen, nobody's arrived yet. We're all on the same playing field here, so stop pointing fingers. And he continues, though. But one thing I do, it's not a lot of things, it's just one thing. Forgetting what is behind is straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize of which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus and so here's the reality of it he says listen haven't arrived yet but one thing I do in order to continue to go that direction is I forget what is behind and uh, this is an important word here because this word in the original language means to dismiss from your mind to stop remembering or to neglect it if you neglect something that means you're not paying attention to it, right? What God is saying is, church, let's start neglecting our past. Let's start the mindset of not thinking about it anymore. If God has dealt with it, then why are you giving it space in your minds? If God has forgiven you of it, then why do you keep asking him to forgive you of it? Why do you sound like a broken record? Just receive what God has given you. It's so hard for us to get to this place because we live in this place where we feel guilty. Now, let me, let me expound on this. The work of the cross is not a historical event only. The work of the cross is a present active event. And so, listen, God has forgiven me from my past, but I step forward as a believer, and guess what I do? I sin again, right? We make mistakes again. Well, the product of the cross, the benefit of the cross, it keeps following me no matter where I go. So when I get to that place where I mess up, I say, God, forgive me. God said, I already have. Remember, the cross was your past, your present, and your future. It's always productive. It always accomplishes what it needs to, and that is your release from what is holding you. Amen? So listen. You say, but Greg, I've been a believer and I messed up again. The guy says, that's all right, the cross is still there. But you don't know what I've done. And I would say, but I don't have to know what you've done. Because God knows it. And the cross of Jesus is sufficient in the present to deal with it. Church, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Stop condemning yourself. 
Stop beating yourself down. Stop walking in defeat. You are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. The power of God in you is greater than the power of your past. The presence of God's power in you today is able to overcome any failure in your life. God is able to forgive you, and God releases you. Why? Because that is the power and sufficiency of a one-time sacrifice for all times. Sometimes I feel like we walk around and say, Jesus, Jesus, could you just die for me one more time? Why? That's the old system, right? The new system, one for all, all time. It's sufficient. And so don't let the devil tell you any different. And don't let all your past be drugged with you. Get going back and fishing in that pond. That pond has been condemned. It's no longer forgiven, cast away. You don't have to go back there. And here's the other thing. People, church, quit taking other people back to that pond. You know, sometimes we hurt people unintentionally. Because we have such a hard time of forgiving people for their past. We really do. We Christians think everybody's supposed to be perfect, except for us. We give ourselves a lot of grace. Isn't it amazing how that works? You and I have to let people go. There is nobody in your life that's not going to mess up again and again and again. There's nobody. You and I have to forgive. Why? Because that's what we received, right? That's what we want. We want forgiveness. We want release. And God is saying, saying, give people what you got. Let them be free from it. Forget the past and move on. Press on to what's ahead. And stop dragging that old dead body around. Stop dragging that trash can around. Stop dragging that stinking thing that you don't need in your life anymore. Why? Because it's not you. It's not what you need. It's not what's going to benefit you. What I want you to experience is this knowledge of Jesus that's so great that you fall desperately in love with him. And then your past, you look back and say, man, that stinks. I'm going this way. It's no longer appealing to you. And so stop letting your past define you. And let the cross redefine you. That's who you really are. That's who we really are. We are not the sum total of all of our experiences. We are the sum total of one experience. And that one experience happened at the cross. And that one experience changes all the other experience. That one experience negates all those other experiences. That one experience is transforming. And so allow that to sink into your mind this morning. And whatever it is that you keep carrying, whatever it is that keeps holding on to you, whatever it is you keep praying over and over again and confessing it over and over again, whatever that is that somebody else did and you keep running in your mind and you're getting more and more angry at them, let go of it. Let it go. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how this would change our families? When you got in an argument, if you could not bring up the past that you had forgiven, you don't have a whole lot of chips to bring to the game, do you? What do I mean by that? You can't start getting historical. You can't, well, you know you remember when? You were in diapers, but do you remember when? Or, you know, you remember when we first got married? Or you remember when you did this? Or you remember when you did that? Listen, listen, listen. Jesus says that the cross is all dealt with. You stop getting historical and release them in the name of Jesus. Does that mean that you don't remember it? You have to remember it through the lens of of the cross you got to remember it the way God remembers yours he looks at his son and he says forgiven we're not talking about it anymore released we're moving on from it what would it look like in our society if we did that 
What would it look like in your marriage? What would it look like with the way that you treat your parents and relate to your parents? I mean, listen, kids, you got, you got a, a file cabinet full of stuff that they've done wrong, right? Are you going to drag your garbage around all your life? Or are you going to let it go? What if we just started the habit this morning of letting it go? Just let it go. It's not as big as you think it is. Let it go. How do I know that? Because he says, listen, when you look heavenward, everything else comes in perspective. In light of heaven, is that going to be a big deal? I don't think so. In light of heaven, when you stand before Jesus, is that going to be? I don't think so. And so this morning, I want to ask you a question. What do you need to let go of? What is it from your past that you need to let go of? You need to say, God, today by the power of the Holy Spirit, I will no longer give this real estate in my mind. You can no longer have space in my head. I give it to you, God. It's yours. Lord, allow me to forget it. You know, when I first became a believer, I think I had reels and reels of tapes in my mind. They kept playing over and 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 over again, all my mistakes. Because I didn't realize this truth. I didn't realize the power of the cross. And then as God began to renew my mind and transform my mind, I realized the reason I couldn't change what I thought about is I wasn't thinking about anything different. Once I started thinking about the Word and the Word began to purify my mind, I began to get so enamored by Jesus I didn't give it the time of day any longer because it didn't have space in my mind. So our declaration today is, God, I declare that this morning my past is my past and the cross has set me free from it. And tomorrow when that thing comes to your mind, I want you to look at it and say, God, I declare right now that my past is the past and the cross has set me free from it. And that next thing that comes up, you say it again. And that next thing that comes up, you say it again. And you keep saying it. And you keep bathing your mind in the sufficiency of the cross. And then also, God, I declare today that I am dead to my way. That my way was the wrong way. And God, I am dead to it. I'm not going back. God, I declare today I will no longer live for the garbage of my past and God I will see it for what it is I will not glamorize it I will not do any of that it is garbage and garbage stinks and God this morning I am taking out the trash amen but listen if you've never been to the cross then you'll never be free from your past if you've never been to the cross, all you have is guilt. All you have is regret. All you have is the things of this life, the things that you think are going to satisfy you. That's all you have. But once you come to the cross, you find freedom from your past. You find release from your past. You find forgiveness from your past. I don't care how bad you've been, how much you messed up. God says that the cross is sufficient for that. And if you're here this morning, you're saying, God, I am sick of my past. God, I am sick of it controlling me. God, I am sick of it telling me how to live, telling me how to think, and controlling every decision I make. God, I'm sick of repeating my mistakes. God, I am desperate this morning. If that's you, the answer is the cross. Would you bow your heads just for a moment for me? Whether you're online or in this room, right now, if you are that person, did you realize for the first time that you have never been to the cross in such a way that you surrendered your life and it has changed you? But this morning you are desperate for change. You are desperate for Jesus that you would say, God, I'll count it all lost for you just so I can know you. I am coming to the cross as a broken person that needs help, that needs forgiveness. If that's where you are, I want you to pray with me this prayer. Jesus, this morning, 
I bring my sin to the cross. And I give it to you. God, I'm so desperate. I believe that you died for me on that cross. And as I stand at the foot of the cross this morning, I die to my past. And invite you into my life to change my future, to give me hope, to give me salvation. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that my eyes would be heavenward. God, I received that gift this morning. Thank you, Jesus. If you're online right now and you're watching, if you're in this room, every head's bowed, every eye's closed. But if you're online watching, right where you are in your room, wherever you are, if you prayed this prayer, I want you to raise your hand. If you're in this room and you prayed this prayer this morning, I want you as a testimony of your step just to raise your hand up real quick and say, Pastor, that was me. That was my step this morning. Just raise it up high and put it back down. I see your hand. I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. Anybody else? Real quick. God, thank you for the decisions this morning. Thank you for the life change this morning, God. As we sing this song, Lord, we are praying for a release in this room, God. A release from all that we talked about. All that's holding us back, God. May all of that fade in a glimpse of who you are, God. Because your greatness and your splendor and your power and your sufficiency and your love and your grace are so much greater than anything we can walk away from, God. And we just want to worship you this morning because you are our king. You're our savior. You're our deliverer, God. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts, God, that you have released us in the name of Jesus.